Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you my definitive video review of the new Tamron 50 to 400 millimeter F4.5 to 6.3 DI3, which means it's for mirrorless. It has VC vibration compensation, their image stabilization system, and it has a VXD focus motor, which we'll talk more about in just a moment. This lens, of course, is a, an intriguing lens in that it's not just an addition to the typical 100 to 400 millimeter class of lens, though that is where it is obviously kind of sized. But by extending that focal length an additional 50 millimeters on the wide end, we end up with a lens that has a much more versatile focal length, allowing you to go from as wide as this to as deep as this. And even at close range, you can go from this uh, kind of framing of a seam to going in, zooming into this kind of potential. So obviously that's going to really add the amount of versatility of the kinds of shots that you can use and makes it far more likely that you might be able to carry just one lens in many type of situations. And, you know, you think about that additional 50 millimeters, it goes from a 100 to 400 to 100 to 400 millimeter range is a four times zoom ratio. 50 to 400 millimeters is an eight times zoom ratio. So that extra 50 millimeters makes a, a pretty huge difference when it comes to the amount of focus possibilities or distance pop possibilities in that zoom range. Now, uh, as a quick breakdown of price point, this uh, lens is coming to market at 1,299 US dollars. That compares to, on the cheap end, the Sigma 100 to 400 DM, which is on sale right now for $850 as of pricing today. And the G Master being the upper end, which is 2,500 US dollars. And so this lens kind of fits into the middle ground but as we're going to find out when it comes to the feature set and the performance, it's certainly closer to the GM side of the equation than probably what it is to the Sigma end of the equation. Tamron is definitely, with some of their most recent lens, has moved upscale in terms of build and features. And then, of course, with this additional zoom, the question is going to be, is it worth an additional $450 US dollars compared to the Sigma? We'll try to answer that as a part of our review here today. First, however, a word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Phantom Wallet, the minimalist modern wallet that is now even better with the new Phantom X that is crafted from aluminum right here in Canada. It is 22% smaller and 35% lighter, while still making it easy to access your cards and money when you need them, thanks to their unique fanning mechanism. You could even customize your wallet due to its modular design, with accessories like a money clip, cash holder, ID display, and even Chipolo and AirTag tracking integration. Visit store.phantomwallet.com to check out their unique sizes, styles, and finishes that span from aluminum to wood to carbon fiber. And use code DUSTIN15 for 15% off when you're ready to check out. So let's talk about the build and the feature set. As I noted, this is a more upscale lens. And while Tamron has given us a bigger zoom range, they've also managed to keep the lens relatively compact. It is 88.5 millimeters in diameter, about three and a half inches. And that leaves us with the very common 67 millimeter front filter thread that Tamron has tried to employ on most all of its uh, Sony based lenses to this point. And they've done a pretty great job of doing that. The lens is 183 millimeters in length, 7.2 inches, which does make it shorter than what even the Sigma is, and certainly shorter than what the G, G Master lens is. The overall weight is 1135 gram, grams, or 40.7 ounces, which is only 20 grams heavier than what the Sigma is, despite having that additional 50 millimeters of zoom range. So I think that they've done an effective job of keeping the lens compact, as you can see here, particularly when you consider that a lens like, you know, the Sony 200 to 600 millimeter um, is massive by comparison. And so kudos to Tamron for controlling the overall size there. It also has a much more uh, rich feature set than what most of Tamron's earlier lens on the platform did. That includes having a focus hold button that can be programmed to various functionality. We have a switch that controls various VC options. And then we have a third custom switch that is tied into the weather sealed USB-C port there on the side. By connecting that to a camera, you can access Tamron's free lens utility software, and you can change and tweak a variety of different behaviors and 
and in those custom switches, you can uh, program a variety of different functions to the one, two, and three positions. And, uh, and so obviously that gives you some added versatility. I'll also note that that USB-C port makes it very easy to apply firmware updates directly, which means that you can help to future-proof your lens for the future. So that is a great move that Tamron has adopted in the last year that I, I commend them for. Speaking of that weather sealing, we actually have a total of nine different seal points throughout the lens. We have a flooring coating on the front element that helps it to have a robust, professional grade type uh, degree of weather sealing and outer performance. The lens is a great looking lens and for some of you that are turned off by uh, telephoto lenses being white, this may be a lens that's intriguing to you for the simple reason that it is black and has a finish that is going to match other lenses there. Now, something that is going to be a little bit controversial is the fact that while the lens is designed to be used with a tripod collar and tripod foot, one is not included. Tamron elected to go with that as an optional accessory. It's going to cost you about $130 US to purchase it. I will note that it is the identical tripod collar that was used for their 100 to 400 millimeter lens on a Canon EF and Nikon F mounts. And so if you happen to own or have owned that lens and you have that tripod collar, it will actually fit here. You might be able to save some money there. Now, on a negative note, which unfortunately is consistently true across the Sony platform, there's a couple of ways that Sony limits uh, third-party lenses, you know, to make them uh, maybe on not quite a level playing field with first-party Sony lenses. One of those is, is that to this point, only Sony lenses are compatible with teleconverters. And so that means if you're wanting to have the versatility of adding on a teleconverter, you're going to have to go to a Sony option because uh, this lens, there's no teleconverter option that exists and it's not really designed for use with teleconverters and that at the 50 milli millimeter position, there actually isn't enough room physically for a teleconverter to even fit. So an unfortunate limitation there. Now, going back to positives for a moment, we do have some incredible versatility when it comes to the minimum focus distance, something that Tamron has really emphasized in adding to the overall versatility of the lens. You can focus at 50 millimeters as closely as only 25 centimeters. That's less than 10 inches, and uh, that allows you to get an extremely high one to two times magnification ratio. That's 0 0.50 times, and there's a lot of lenses you know, lenses that I own or have owned that call themselves macro lenses that have only that degree of magnification. At 400 millimeters, you can focus as closely as one and a half meters, so not nearly as close, but you still have a quite high one to four times magnification or a 0 0.25 times. It's very useful at both ends of the spectrum, and of course you can scale in between, um, and uh, I found that that to be useful even in like the 200 millimeter range for these shots, for example, that I took of the Canon 16 millimeters. I did the product shots with, with this lens, and you could see how I could really compress out that background and make for very nice product type shots with it. It also, as noted, includes uh, Tamron's vibration compensation. And I have found that in, in so many situations, it is very effective. For example, I got this shot of Loki at 1 13th of a second. It's perfectly stable. I could get that shot repeatedly without issue. I will note, however, that when it comes to video results, that uh, Tamron says that the VC, it really helps to compensate between up to 100 millimeters for uh, kind of senses and has an intelligent AI that helps with stabilization. Above that, however, I did note that it wasn't as effective. And you can see in some of these long distance um, video shots that there is a little bit of jumping around. And I noted kind of the same behavior in the viewfinder that I never really saw a perfectly stabilized viewfinder in the way that I've seen with some Tamron lenses in the past. Overall, however, the list of build and features here is robust. The lens handles very well. Um, it zooms out very nicely. No issues there. Also, I'll note that the uh, focus ring moves very smoothly as well. On the note of focus, this does have their VXD linear focus motor system. That is their premium best focus system that is available. And uh, it is very fast, it is smooth, it is quiet in operation. It's a great focus system. I will note that one of the new features that comes with the custom button is that you can set it to a focus limiting position and you can actually tweak what that focus limiting distance is going to be. And so uh, that's another way where you can help to improve focus speed if you are so inclined. 
When it comes to tracking results, I got my friends at Gen Gengar Goldens to uh, supply me test subjects once again. And what I found is that tracking capability was, was very good. Um, I got an 82% perfectly focused rate during my, you know, quick burst and 88% that were acceptably well focused. And so that really is about as good a result as I've seen from a third party lens. I would say that both the GM and the 200 to 600 are slightly better. And the other thing that I will note is that uh, I mentioned there's two ways that Sony limits third party lenses. The second was when it comes to burst rate, that the burst rate is limited at 15 frames per second with a third party lens like this. Now that's not going to matter if you're shooting anything other than the A9 or Alpha 1 series. I was testing on the Alpha 1 for these bursts, which means that I got 15 frames per second, whereas with if I was shooting with the Sony GM, I would have been able to get 30 frames per second. And you know, that can be a serious limitation and it kind of, you know, you're going to have to determine how much that affects your actual uh, shooting. I will also note that in a couple of fairly difficult situations, IEF worked well in that uh, one of these was with a black squirrel where there is, as you can see, there's, there's basically no contrast between the eye and the body, but it tracked perfectly in a series of shots. And as you can see, we're well focused. I also shot some photos of Loki through the rails on my uh, deck and it was able to get past that close distraction and focus accurately on the eye and deliver very, very good results. So overall, uh, focus system works really, really well, just not quite as good as what you're going to find in a first party Sony lens for a couple of reasons. So let's talk about the image quality from the lens itself. The MTF chart suggests a very strong performance. Let's dive in and see if that's what we actually see in real life. So we'll start by taking a quick look at vignette and distortion at 50 millimeters and really throughout the range. It's kind of the same story, and that is that there is uh, varying degrees of pincushion distortion and then a bit of vignette. The pincushion distortion, um, it in increases and then it decreases a bit uh, as you go throughout the zoom range. The vignette is basically its heaviest, as we're going to see here. Now, Tamron lenses do get full profile support, and so that won't be a problem for in camera or video and eventually for raw files. That comes out as a minus six for the distortion it's all of it is nice and linear corrects just fine and then vignette a plus 38 and sliding the midpoint over a good good ways plus 38 means that we're at about a stop and a half right under two stops in the corner so nothing extreme there the middle of the zoom range, I used a minus 10. This is where the distortion is the heaviest, but you can see it's still very nice and linear, corrects just fine. Vignette has dropped a bit to plus 31. And then at 400 millimeters, a little bit less distortion. Again, still very linear, a minus 9 to correct, and then a plus 27 for the vignette. So nothing significant there, no major issues to report. Now, as far as longitudinal chromatic aberrations that show up before and after the plane of focus, uh, in this shot, you can see it's just totally flooded with light and and so uh, lots of opportunities i see just the faintest little touches of some fringing in this some of those really uh high contrast areas but you can see as we go out of focus towards the bokeh here there is no fringing to be seen there nicely controlled obviously a secondary image here with again with you know transition areas going towards defocus and this is a less extreme lighting situation so as a byproduct i don't see anything um that i'm concerned about at all so so we've got longitudinal chromatic aberrations, well controlled. Another a shot kind of with heavy light here moving through uh, these uh, flowers here. And as you can see, nothing to be concerned about in any of the contrast or defocus areas. So I consider longitudinal chromatic aberrations to be well resolved. Now, lateral chromatic aberrations show up along the edge of the frame in uh, situations like these high contrast branches. But we can see once again that there is nothing to look to here. All nice and clean. No issue there at all. So our MTF chart suggests a very strong uh, performance, um, both at the wide and the telephoto ends. We'll take a look to see if that's true in my chart test, again, done on a Sony Alpha 1, so 50 megapixels, and I'm showing you this at 200% magnification. You can see from the test chart here that at 50 millimeters, we have fantastic sharpness in the center of the frame. As we move towards the mid frame, it similarly looks just fantastic. And if I scroll down here towards the corner, it also looks really, really fantastic. This is an extremely sharp, very even optical performance at 50 millimeters, you know, really one of the best that I've seen. 
Stopping on down even as far as F8 produces some improvement, but it's really quite minimal. I think more than anything, I see a little bit more contrast. Everything looks a little bit brighter, and you can see you know, really more in the areas of contrast. There's a little bit more kind of sparkle to the eye, so to speak. But a lot of the resolution was already there on tap to begin with. And even going down into the corner, you can see an improvement, but again, it's more contrast, less resolution. 50 millimeters is fantastic. Now, because this is a variable aperture zoom, the minimum aperture is going to change as every time that you see a change to the maximum aperture. So wide open is at f22, and so uh, we'll just dive in here. And as per usual, diffraction is robbing us of a lot of that acuity, uh, ability to render those fine details. And so again, I like to use f11 as a practical limit, f16 if I'm really, really desperate, but uh, I would say avoid f22 or smaller apertures as you go across the zoom range. The next marked area on the zoom ring is 70 millimeters. Maximum aperture has closed to f5. And so in that you know 20 um, um, millimeters of focal length, you have lost a third of a stop of light. We can see that the lens remains really, really excellent wide open with only minimal improvement to be found when stopping down. That's true in the mid frame and that's true right down into the corner. Very strong performance still at 71 millimeters. Now at 100 millimeters, our maximum aperture is stopped at f5.6, and I will pause for just a second to say that that is one limitation of starting the zoom range earlier, that we have a little bit less light gathering than some competing lenses. However, I will point out that the Sigma 100 to 400 millimeter DN, it does start at f5 at 100 millimeters, but it is hit f5.6 by 113 millimeters, so minimal advantage there. A little more advantage for the G Master that starts at f4.5, though it also loses light pretty quickly and by about 150 millimeters it's going to have dropped to uh, f5.6 still something worth pointing out now as far as our performance it continues to be excellent you can see really strong resolution in the center of the frame a mild improvement when stopping down to f8 mid frame also looks excellent down into the corners corners still looking very excellent with only minimal gain to be had when stopping down to f8 if we take a look at a real world wide open shot at 100 millimeters, you can see that we're getting really, really great detail as Loki takes a bath here, but all of the fur is really finely rendered, really great contrast, a strong performance for sure. So at 135 millimeters, which is the next mark spot, a maximum aperture has now closed or has remained the same, I should say, at f5.6. And so we can see again that stopping down uh, to f8 produces just a little bit more improvement, which shows that there's just a little bit more gain to be had. But overall, our performance still looks very, very strong. Maybe a little weaker here in the corner. You can see more of an improvement when stopping down to f8 in the corner performance. Now, it's interesting if we take a look at the uh, comparison at 200 millimeters to the Sony 200 to 600 millimeter, which I consider to be a really fantastic lens, uh, one that I personally have purchased. Uh, we can see here, however, that there is really little difference to be seen between the two lenses. Um, you can see in the mid frame that they look about similar and down into the corner, the uh, ratio of the shot was just a little bit different from between the t times I did the two tests. You can see that there is a little bit of an edge for the Sony in this corner. However, I did note that if I looked in the upper corner here that I felt like the um, Tamron actually looked like the better of the two. And so it really kind of depends on where you're looking pretty much an equal performance. At 300 millimeters, maximum aperture is f6.3, which obviously it's going to remain throughout the zoom range. We see pretty similar to what we saw at around 135 millimeters with a good center performance that improves a little bit when stopped down, a good mid-frame performance also that improves just a little bit, and a uh, corner performance that isn't quite as strong as what it was on the wide end, but is still quite good. I'll also point out that for many telephoto shots, uh, absolute corner performance is really going to be only rarely important. A lot of times you are shooting more towards the middle two thirds of the frame. And you can see here, even in fast moving action, that I've got a really crisp result on this uh, running golden retriever, properly focused, great detail, no problems there. 
At 400 millimeters, we see really kind of the same story we've been seeing, a performance that lags a little bit behind what we saw between 50 and 100 millimeters, but still very, very strong with mild improvements when stopping on down uh, to F8. I think a tiny bit less contrast I see here, but again, a quite even performance even towards the edge of the frame where you can see particularly at F8, it still has nice detail being rendered there at a 200% magnification on a 50 megapixel body. For perspective, we'll take a look at a few wide open 400 millimeter shots at 100% magnification. As you can see here, really good contrast, really beautiful detail uh, throughout the veins of the leaf there. Uh, in this shot of Loki shooting through the bars, you can see very nice detail and rendering of all of the fur there. Uh, taking a look at the moon, and you can see as we crop in here, look at the fantastic detail on the craters that are shown there. Uh, that's a really crisp looking result. And then at 400 millimeters of this black squirrel, even with me having to raise shadows a bit, this is a really tough subject right here against a uh, bright background. But you can see the focus nailed as we've already discussed, but also you can see that there's nice detail and precision in the shot. And while it's a simple subject from an artistic perI really love this shot and this is you know right out of camera um, it shows number one I mean really great detail and all of the patina and textures of the rusted area and then also of the various wood surfaces on the side of the barn I also really love the color and the contrast of the image just a, a great looking image that really appeals to me artistically of course what's great about a lens like this is you can start off at 50 millimeters and you know, get great detail all throughout the frame here. But then you can also take that same shot and you can zoom in. Now, when you're shooting over this kind of distance over various pockets, you get a little bit of an atmospheric effect that kind of takes the textures and almost gives them a painterly type effect. But you can see that it is resolving all the way out there over all of the loops of the road. But I mean, what a difference in the framing going from that to that standing in the exact same spot. Now, in this case, I'm not looking to work the extremes necessarily, but as a landscape proposition, I could frame this image like this, a pretty conventional, you know, wider angle shot. I could also zoom into some of those details with the mist coming off the river and just really frame a scene in multiple ways, um, all of which I thought were appealing. And this is a little over 200 millimeters here, but obviously a very valuable focal length. Now, a quick word on that maximum magnification. This is the same bill that we have been looking at for our test chart. You can see that at that one to, uh, one to two times magnification up close with 50 millimeters, you can get a very high degree of, uh, of uh, magnification and very good detail, though you're not getting a perfectly flat plane of focus, obviously. Go back a little bit with the 400 millimeter end and you go to half the magnification. So this is a, a one to four or 0 0.25 times magnification, but with a flatter plane of focus and also a good performance. Now that makes for a very useful type lens. I mean, obviously for doing macro light type work, I mean, that's a really great looking image up close there. Um, this dandelion clocks you can see are all really nicely rendered um, at a high magnification level and then here uh, with this shot of these little tiny flowers at the uh, 50 millimeter end I was able to get in really close and obviously that's a lot of magnification and nice detail there wide open and then I could also step back and frame at the 400 millimeter zone so I don't get quite the degree of magnification but I can really compress the background and obviously if you're working with an insect or something it gives you a lot of working distance while still having a very useful amount of magnification that's going to really add to the versatility of the lens. Now flare resistance in general was good. I did see probably my most flare artifacts in this very bright scene uh, at 50 millimeters here. And you can see that there's been a little bit of veiling, a little loss of contrast, and a few little uh, ghosting uh, artifacts. No big deal there. Shooting off the telephoto end, I the B-bar generation two coatings really seem to do the trick. I see nothing in this image to detract from it. Obviously shooting into very bright morning sun to where I'm getting this uh, very fast shutter speed. But you can see that I got a great looking image out of it. Now obviously if you get really close as you've seen in some of these images you can completely destroy a background but even in situations where the background is not completely obliterated the quality of the bokeh is really not too bad this is a really complicated scene because I'm shooting this mushroom down right amongst the grasses so you can see that there's great detail on the side of the cap there but even with all of this stuff going on it's 
really not too bad. And here, you know, the background's not far away, but it is nicely blurred out. And so there's a lot of potential with this lens to create a, a wide variety of images, obviously, and that's what really makes it a very versatile lens. So in conclusion, this is a lens that obviously does a lot of things really, really well. And if there's one word I could use to describe it, it would be the word versatile. I really appreciate that extra 50 millimeters in focal length. And I think that in part, this makes this a really, really effective landscape option because you are able to frame a little bit more reasonably on the wide end, but then to have all of those different options on how you're going to frame a scene um, from, on the telephoto end. And so that versatility plus the added versatility of the extreme close focus uh, capabilities mean that this is a lens that you can do a lot of different types of photography with and do them all really quite well. I also uh, found that, you know, you look at the sum of the parts when it comes to the feature, the autofocus, and then the image quality. This is a lens that really is quite complete and has very it really has no fatal flaws that I can point to. Really kind of the biggest flaws are those artificial limitations that Sony has placed on them. And really those artificial limitations are the biggest reason to consider a Sony option if those things particularly matter to you. Either the ability to use teleconverters or if you use an A9 or Alpha 1 body and you want to get the maximum amount of frames per second, then those are the reasons to buy a first party Sony lens. But I will note that you're going to spend, if it's to the 200 to 600, you're going to spend an additional $700. If it's the G Master, you're going to spend an additional $1,200. And so that is a, a huge price disparity. Now, when it comes to considering whether or not to choose the Sigma instead, at least as far as the MTF charts go, and I don't have a head-to-head -head comparison with the Sigma because I was using a different camera body when I tested it and uh, in a different test chart. And so I don't really have an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, but at least looking at the MTFs, the Tamron is a little bit sharper. And also I will say um, that the autofocus here is superior to what I found on the Sigma lens in speed and accuracy for uh, tracking. And so um, it does have some advantages relative to the Sigma. It is a better built lens, a little bit more feature-rich lens than what the Sigma is. But of course, it is a fair bit more expensive, about $450, and you're going to have to choose for yourself whether or not you know, the additional uh, versatility and performance of this lens is worth that because the Sigma is already quite a decent lens. At the end of the day, however, this is a great addition to the Sony catalog and also to the Tamron catalog as well. It shows you know, Tamron's kind of next level development. In many ways, we see the G2 improvements on Sony all brought into this lens, which makes it a superior lens, though I think we've also seen a price point that's maybe a little bit higher than what it might have been if it had come prior to you know, kind of the more upscale um, move that Tamron has made on Sony. A very welcome lens, and you can determine for yourself whether it's one that should be in your own kit. If you want more information, check out the description down below where you can find my text review. You can also find access to my image gallery. There's also buying links if you'd like to purchase one for yourself. And of course, beyond that, links to follow myself or Craig on social media. Uh, linkage there to become a patron or to purchase channel merchandise. And if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button right here on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Have a great day and let the light in. <laughs>